So Dan, I heard that you wrote an amazing book. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, this was actually a, a really, really cool experience. Uh, I got a chance to co-author a book with Jack Canfield. So my agent had called up and said, he worked with Jack as well and said that he had a great opportunity for us to uh, be able to, to kind of work with him and submit a, submit a chapter in a book that he was doing with a couple other authors that specialize in leadership and, and team building. And uh, we got the opportunity to be a part of that. So it's really exciting. What's the name of the book? It's the uh, Soul of Success Volume 2. And uh, it's an Amazon book, and we've already hit a few bestseller lists, so it's, it's done really well. And I heard you also won an award. I did. I did. I, got, uh, I, I was uh, awarded a national uh, bestselling author award uh, called Aquili. So we, uh, we flew out to the Roosevelt uh, in, uh, in L.A., stayed out there, got a chance to meet Brian Tracy and some other uh, pretty big names and, and accept that award. So my wife and I spent a great weekend out in, out in L.A. doing that. Fantastic. So now... How do you go from starring in the room to being an award-winning author? So, well, it was kind of funny. You know, I had moved to L.A. Uh, right after we, we had done, um, I used to bobsled professionally, and so uh, we had moved to L.A. right after that, and I had the opportunity to be a part of the room, which was, at the time, was just an opportunity for me to get some screen time, right? They, they teach you, you've got to be able to get some film on yourself, and, you know, that's how you build your resume in the film industry, right? So... That was the idea to come out here do that, and I, I really had some great opportunities that came up, you know, for a few years doing that. But that led to me going out to Texas. Uh, I got a chance to experience Austin, which is where I've I've lived, and my family and I are out there. We've been there for about ten years, and just other opportunities that kind of expose themselves. And one of them was the uh, the opportunity to kind of do some writing. I've got a couple other books that we're uh, we're doing right now that should be out within the next year, and uh, it's it's just been a, a whirlwind. We've had a little little chance to dabble in a lot of things. I would say what an exciting resume you have. It's um, been cool. Yeah. How did you get involved with uh, Tommy and the room? So, you know, Greg did a great job of talking about this in his book, The Disaster Artist. So I had just moved to L.A., and my old roommate at the time was the guy who was supposed to play the original Mark. So, you know, everybody knows the story that they've gone through several, you know, film crews over the free, uh, filming of the room. Uh, actors were replaced. Well, my old roommate was one of those people. He was replaced, you know, early on because he quit and walked off the set. So uh, at the time, he had called me up and said, "Hey, Dan, you know, here's this opportunity. They're looking for a, kind of a bigger guy." And I had just finished, you know, doing the Olympic thing, so I was, you know, a little bit bigger at that time. And said, "Here's a here's this great chance for you to come in." So I said, "Well, what do I have to do?" Because I hadn't done any acting at that point, you know, just little things. And he said, "Well, I know Tommy, and what he's going to do is he's going to ask you, you know, what style of." you know, acting you do. And at the time, I had no clue what he was talking about, right? So he basically told me, he said, there's Meisner and there's Stanislavski, and he basically gave me some really just basic tips so at least I sounded like I knew what I was talking about. So I showed up, you know, went off to the audition, uh, sat in front of Tommy, and, and Tommy was so funny. I mean, you know, it was just, he's so serious about what he does, right? But he does it in a really kind of goofy way. And uh, I, I interviewed with him or auditioned and got the part. So tell me a little bit more about working with Tommy. Like, what kinds of things did he say and do to you? <laughs> Tommy was a trip. I, I got to tell you, I, I can't say anything negative about him uh, as a person. I mean, he's, you know, he, he was a guy that came out and he did his job, and obviously he's, he's been very successful doing it. Um, but the funny thing about the way Tommy did things was it was always kind of from the hip. You know, you'd show up, and you have to recall that my part was maybe – you know, 30, 45 seconds max. Uh, I was originally uh, at, the, uh, at the shoot for two weeks. So I'd have days where there was just nothing going on. And again, you have to remember, I was completely yellow at the time. I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing, what, you know, you did as an actor. So I was there and I just practiced the one scene that I had. I thought I had several, but he wouldn't let you see anything, right? So I, I, there's got to be more to this, right? My, my scene just can't be this, you know, piece that's just out there like an island. I mean, there's got to be something that leads up to it and something after. Well, we all know that that is exactly what it was, right? So uh, I was out there for two weeks, filmed this part, and there was never any dailies. You didn't know if you were shooting that day or not, but you were just required to be there. And he thought that he was doing everybody a huge favor by making Subway available to us, so we'd have sandwiches every day. So he'd, he'd feel great about the fact that it's okay, you know, it's, I, I can't do the accent like Greg does, but it's okay, everybody's here, you know, because I'm taking care of them and I'm feeding them and, you know... So anyway, it was, uh, it was two weeks at that point. Then I had left. Uh, I thought I was done. 
And then uh, I got a call from Greg saying, you need to come back. Tommy decided he doesn't want to do the drug dealer scene in an alley. He wants to do the drug dealer scene on a roof, which is so normal, right? I mean, where else would you run into the guy that owes you money but on a roof of a building? You know, he's playing basketball, which of course also is normal. And so we, you know, uh, after a lot of coercing and convincing, I came back and, and shot again up on the roof. So I think altogether I, I was there for three weeks of shooting in total. So what did you think when you heard about Robin's Kickstarter project? Well, you know, I got to tell you, I, I thought it was, at first I was really surprised because I thought, well, you know, I mean, how much, really, how much blood can you take from this rock, right? I mean, here's this movie, and we talked about it earlier, right? Here's this film that should really have not gotten beyond week one, right? And then suddenly it went from week one to being made into a book, and then it went from the book to this uh, deal that, you know, James Franco and Seth Rogen are going to do, and now there's this mockumentary, and I'm thinking, how in the world can these things continue to come from this one piece, and, and I use the word piece in the way that you probably think I was using it, right? So, you know, when I heard Robin was doing this at first, I, I kind of thought, well, who's going to put it together? And I didn't know her to be a director or a writer. And, uh, you know, as she was setting over pieces and showing, hey, this is what I've developed and this is what, where the script is going to go, I mean, it was really funny. It was really cool to see what she was doing. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see how this all comes together. It's been a, a really fun experience. So what's it like to play an alternate version of yourself, of your character in this project? <laughs> Well, my, my wife would like to tell you that that is that she dates two men, right? I would hope that that's not true. You know, I'd hope that I'm not Chris R. in any respect, but it's kind of funny. Um, but it's it's really kind of fun to do something that you're that that's not your normal day to day life. I, I would bore the heck out of you if I told you that you know on a day to day basis I'm, you know, working with people in insurance sales and you know doing stuff like that, right? So to be able to kind of play a, a Chris R. character or be able to go to the screenings and you know, get involved with the mockumentary and come in and, and re, you know, revive that role has, uh, has really been a lot of fun. Do you still keep in touch with, other than this project, do you keep in touch with people from the room? You know, Mike and I kept in touch for a long time right afterwards. Uh, you know, Chocolate Mike, I, I call him, you know, with Michelle. Uh, Greg has been a great friend. I mean, he and I have kept in really close touch. So whenever he comes into Houston or Austin, which is where I'm at now, uh, we'd spend, you know, time and go out. And as a matter of fact, I'll be seeing him in a couple weeks when he's back out there. Uh, as far as a lot of the other actors, Robin's been great online, and, and actually Denny, right? Philip, I've talked to as well, but um, I guess I'm going to change my answer. The answer would be yes, because I've talked to Kyle, Philip, all those guys. We've, we've kept uh, pretty, pretty tight, I'd say, about half the cast, and, and I've kept in, in good contact over the last 10 years. Have you been in contact with Tommy? I have not seen Tommy at all. Uh, we, we were supposed to, as a matter of fact, he was doing a show at the Alamo Draft House, and I was so bummed because... We missed it. And my wife was like, you got to go. You know, this would be so much fun. We're not even going to tell him you're going to be there. We're just going to, you know, because Tommy kind of likes to do his own thing anyway. So we weren't even going to say we were there. We just wanted to kind of watch and, you know, quietly in the back of the room. Uh, but we didn't make it over. And that would have been the, the closest I got to Tommy. Now I got to tell you, it, it's amazing to me whenever I see something on social media that goes viral. And the fact that a couple of guys would go to this film and they got their friends to come over and their friends got their friends. I mean, to me, that is amazing that they've been able to take that and, and create this viral phenomenon that they've done. But I think the reason people like it is just because it's so off the wall and it's so over the top. You know, I mean, there's so many things you can find. I'm sure there's things that people haven't even found yet in the room that, you know, whenever I go to a screening in, you know, California, it's different than a screening I'll go to in New York. And people really get excited about different things. So I think that aspect of it, that, that imperfection is what makes it a lot of fun. And the fact that it's community, you know, if you go to Rocky Horror, you've got to at least be able to kind of sing the songs here. It doesn't matter. If you can throw a spoon, have at it, have a good time, you know, it's just, it's just a lot of fun to do that. What's your best memory from being involved with the room? You know, honestly, it, and it's funny to say this because it was also the thing that was the most annoying, but my best memory was sitting around waiting for us to do whatever we're going to do next because... It was, it's all the people that are in this mockumentary, right? I mean, it, it was, you know, Julia, Daniel, and Philip Haldeman, and Kyle, and, you know, Michelle, and Mike, and, you know, all those guys. It, it was really a great group of people just to kind of just hang out with. And I, I felt like the, you know, like the kind of outsider because, you know, for the script that we had at that point, you know, these guys had done a lot of things, and they were the, kind of the main characters. And just to hang out with them and, and be able to spend time, they're, they're all super, super cool people. 
And that was hands down the funnest part about the entire experience. How do you think someone like Tommy got such a, a, a great group of people? Is it was that because he is a good is good at casting, or he knew that you guys were going to be wonderful, or? You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I you know, I, I don't think anybody would argue that this movie has become the perfect storm, right? I mean, you go through three crews of people. You go through multiple lead characters, or I guess co-stars, right, to the lead character that Tommy played. Um, you, you've just got so many people that filtered in and out, and somehow or another, the pieces lined up enough to make a horrible enough movie that it became a good enough movie that people wanted to go see it and, you know, love seeing it. So I, 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 I can't think of any other way to describe it than that perfect storm of things coming together. If you could tell Tommy anything, what would you tell him? I would tell Tommy that I am completely blown away by the mastery and just by the, I, I, I gotta tell you, I give him so much credit for being at that premiere and having everybody laughing at this thing that he, and he could say he didn't feel this way, but he did. I mean, it was supposed to be a drama, this serious piece of art that he's, you know, you know, your best friend is, you know, cheating on you with your girlfriend. And I mean, it was so serious to him. And for him to be able to recognize that, hey, you know what, this is, the audience is laughing and the audience is, is taking this to be this big joke and that's the way that they're taking this, this thing that I put out there. And for him to say, you know what, okay, I'm gonna go with that. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into this tug of war with the audience. I'm gonna say that that's the way I want it to be. I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to move that direction. We're gonna have these ridiculous showings I, I give him huge credit for that because I, I think a lot. I think I personally would have fought that and just been disappointed in what happened and, and the fact that it didn't work the way that I wanted it to. When do you think he adjusted his attitude? Do you think it was while he was watching the movie, or after the movie, or the next day? I I, I really I saw it firsthand the night that the movie came out because I remember we were sitting back there and we were watching the movie and we were giggling the whole time because again none of us knew the whole storyline. Right? Unless you were you know, Juliet Daniel or one of the characters that was there from start to finish, you just didn't know what it was. So we're giggling and we're watching the audience giggle and, and of course there's a lot of discomfort there right, in the audience. But he very quickly just kind of went with it and he didn't, you know, he didn't I, I never once saw him get into a back and forth with anybody over it or get pissed or mad about the response. And to me that's, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing.